The first of those is Andrew Bereri from um, um, Bay of Plenty Regional Council. He's the Lake Operations Manager there and um, his role is really to manage the implementation of actions to restore the 12 lakes uh, in the catchment. Fairly easy, what are you going to do next week, I wonder? Anyway, he's going to tell us um, about that program, so please welcome Andrew. Well, uh, good afternoon, uh, ladies and gentlemen. Um, they tell me this time of the day is the worst time uh, people go to sleep, and uh, so you've got to do something to wake them up. So I've got something planned here to wake you all up, um, but I sort of want to incorporate that with uh, a little bit of a uh, comforting or welcome to our Aussie cousins. And I say Aussie cousins, uh, it actually means more to me uh, than you might think because I don't have any New Zealand cousins. All my cousins are Australian. Um, and so I think a lot of people in New Zealand are probably like that, a lot of linkages with Australia in many different ways right through from both countries' developments, from colonies and through the wars and so on. Um, but something that uh, you have to admire about the Australians is that they are very good at telling stories. They're very good at telling stories uh, through their poetry, through their music and so on. And if you go to Australia, you often hear uh, this music. We don't do that so much in New Zealand, and so I admire you people for that. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, actually play a little bit of music, which is a little bit crazy, but I've got to put my um, gear on first. This is my genuine uh, kangaroo leather skin hat. Purchased in Surfers Paradise just recently. And I've got a, a little rendition of a, uh, of a song that uh, should be close to your heart, and it's a tribute to you Australians. Um, it's my rendition, so if you think I've played it wrong, don't say anything. Um, some parts of it will be right. Can you hear me now? I'm uh, supposed to be on a different microphone now, and I think I was supposed to tell you something about the uh, Rotorua Lakes, and I can't see with my glasses on because there's so much reflection. But I'm going to give you a little bit of a rundown on our uh, Rotorua Lakes program because I'm the operations manager for that uh, program in Rotorua, and it's actually, I think it's the best job at our council because we actually have uh, a lot of good plans, we have a lot of good science around it, and uh, we actually have some really good funding to do the work that we have to do. These are the things I'm going to talk about, all listed up there, but what I'm going to try and do is go quite quickly down the, the list there and get to the actions, and I think the next phase is what you people are most interested in. So we've got 12 lakes in our program at Rotorua, and they are, some of those lakes are really good quality, some of them are poor quality. So really what we've got to do is we want to avoid this sort of thing. We don't want health warnings and algal blooms on our lakes, and uh, we're trying to protect these lakes here. That's a lake with 12 to 13 metres of water quality. Not quite as nice as Taupo, but uh, certainly a very high quality lake. Um, to be able to do this work, you need to know where these, uh, what the problem is, is and where nutrients and so on are coming from that are driving these types of algal issues. Um, quite often the, whoops, pushed the wrong button there in my hurry. Quite often the, uh, the um, urban people will say, well, it's all these guys' problem, the farmers. Quite often the farmers say, well, it's all these guys' problem here, and there has been in the past quite a bit of finger pointing. Quite often people forget that there's residual and natural inputs from geothermal sources, from forestry, all those sorts of things. There's always some nutrient inputs. Everybody knows that something comes out of the sediments, but they don't know how much, and they don't know how we're going to control that. So this table here is a very quick summary of sort of where these things are petitioned at the moment. So you can see there forest and bush, still some nutrients coming from it, pasture, a very big contributor there. Uh, we put lifestyle and urban there, and having said that, there has been a lot of 
work to reduce lifestyle in urban. So it was a big contributor. It's getting smaller and smaller. There are some of these sources like geothermal, uh, big phosphorus inputs, uh, groundwater inputs, big phosphorus inputs, and we can do things to address that. And hey, look at this, releases of nutrients from sediments. That's 36 tonnes of phosphorus coming into Lake Rotorua potentially from sediment releases annually. That total there adds up to about 40 tonnes. So it's, a, it's, it's roughly equivalent to what could come from the catchment if you have lake conditions that are conducive to releases from sediment. Another complexity, of course, is uh, that it takes some time for any nutrients from the land, that land use, to uh, then get through into the lake, and we've got a lot of research around that, but on average that's 60 years. So you could take land use change, and it could take a long time before that uh, improves the lake water quality. Uh, having said that, think back also that if land use uh, has been increasing for the last 100 years, then we still haven't seen the peak of the nutrients coming to the lake, particularly the nitrogen. So we've still got the uh, freight train to come. So what, what are we doing about this? This is uh, getting into the actions things very briefly. We have uh, a bunch of actions which we think are more short-term type actions. So these are things, these are like in-lake type things, in-stream type things that can address uh, where nutrients come from and see if we can uh, resolve those things more quickly. Because if we're asking a community to pay uh, for Lake Rotorua, uh, it's in the vicinity of $100 million for a lake restoration program, then they probably want to see something before they die, or else they're going to be a little disappointed if they've spent a lot of money and achieved nothing. So we have a bunch of projects that uh, address uh, in-lake stuff. Uh, this includes some of our sediment capping work, and um, I won't stop on that slide other than to say that red area is, uh, is the deepest parts of Lake Rotorua, and that's where we think the main uh, nutrient release comes from, particularly the phosphorus release, and that's about, Lake Rotorua is about 80 uh, square kilometres, and that's, that area in red is about 2,500, uh, about 25 square kilometres or 2,500 hectares, and that would be the area that we need to deal with to stop sediment releases. Some of the work that we've been doing around sediment releases is applying stuff to smaller lakes and seeing how that uh, reduces phosphorus. Wow, look at that, this is the sort of thing.
you could actually reduce your nitrogen footprint. But more significantly, I think, is if you look at these numbers under here, and it says 28 to 100 kilograms of nitrogen per hectare, or 8 to 15. And what that tells me is that there are actually people who are dairy farming who are producing a lot of nitrogen or leaching a lot of nitrogen, and there's some who are leaching a lot less nitrogen. And I think this is the space that we need to be starting to really work hard on. And it's been really encouraging to come here and hear um, particularly one presentation yesterday from Alison Dews that, um, that demonstrated here in the Waikato there's people that can work down at this level here and let's hope we can get that uh, in Rotorua um, because certainly within our economy as Rotorua we're the same as any part of New Zealand uh, we quite like to make money and uh, we don't want to try and get rid of all the industries that are actually making good business for us so if we can find ways that they can produce and meet the environmental uh, expectations of the community then that's going to be a fantastic win-win I'm not going to spend much time on this slide. All I'm going to tell you here is that uh, what we're talking about in terms of spending money, in terms of uh, changes uh, and the way people operate, I think it's going to be obviously a, a land, use, land use change and a land management change mix. So it's a little bit of a mix of that diagram. Some people may think they could shift out of uh, particularly high leaching, uh, nutrient leaching uh, farming types into lower leaching uh, farming types and then others will think, well, they want to stay in that farming type where they're making uh, a, a better income, but they can change their practices and remain in that. Now, when you look at this list, don't, uh, don't think this is anywhere near an exhaustive or an informed list of options around land management change. It's just to give you some examples, and I'll relate it to, uh, I think this really, the idea of this, the three main points there come from a group that I'll mention at the end of, on the very last slide of my presentation. Um, they've said they're pretty much for land management change, there's three different ways that you could achieve that. And, and I think they're talking about using a combination of these on any farm. So the structural things on the property, you can say, hey, we're gonna bring in uh, dams and uh, sediment dams on some of our, our uh, low contour or flat contour country and when the storm events, we actually s slow the flow down on those areas, sediment can settle out, and then over a period of a couple of days, it can drain out. Having said that, a lot of farmers don't want that to be there for three weeks because that's some of their most productive land, of course. There's other management things that you can do, like wintering options. Uh, it's how you manage your fertiliser, and I mean, that's been mentioned uh, over the last couple of days, people taking much more account of how they manage the fertiliser and it's not just doing your fertiliser budget and then putting it in a box and saying I did that, it's actually using that. And uh, things like DCDs, whether they're going to work in the Rotorua area or not. And then don't discount the possibility of these things, research innovation. So whether that's genetic, uh, genetics of the animal or whether that's genetics of your pasture species and uh, things like watercress harvesting which can be used potentially to take nutrients out of fresh water sources. Um, this one here, so which, this came up again yesterday too, the sort of regulatory voluntary mix, you know, and people were asking the question, well, should we um, put rules in place and force people to, um, force people to change, or should we uh, have uh, more voluntary uh, methods of doing that, and some sort of encouragement and incentives? And uh, I think I've already stated, I think there's going to be a mix of those two required. Um, and it, what, I, what I want to do is just focus on that second bullet point down there, uh, council incentives. So are we going to put some dollars into it or are we, going to do, are we just going to put rules in place? And uh, for the Bay of Plenty, we already have a rule in place which prevents farmers from in, increasing their um, nutrient footprint on uh, five lake catchments in our program. Um, and it, I'm not sure that's been very well received. It, in many ways is quite inequitable to many farmers because um, it means if you've been a good land custodian and you've had bush and uh, forestry on your property with low nutrient uh, footprints, you get a benchmark which is very low. And if you haven't been a particularly good custodian of your land and you've leached a lot of nutrients, you get a benchmark which is very high. So it appears to me it's re rewarding uh, the bad guys. So uh, I think there's gonna be a discussion around how with the community how that should be managed into the future and obviously it's not simple. But uh, I think we're talking about, you know, what's the combination of dollars and rules that will come into place and for our council, our 10 year plans signalling that yes there are going to be some dollars, but I think they're also signalling that there's an expectation from farmers 
that uh, a certain level of best management practice is something you should be doing uh, as, um, as a good farmer and you shouldn't be expecting to be paid a whole lot of money for that. But there may be other management and structural changes that need um, financial support. Having said that, um, necessity is the mother of invention and uh, if you don't put in place rules I would say that you'll have a fairly significant proportion of farmers who will really never bother even looking at these incentives unless they're forced to. So you do need, in my view, rules uh, to do things. Now I've put watch the space and this is my last slide and this is like really, this is probably the most exciting part of our program at the moment because um, there's an agreement between these two groups called the Waiora Agreement and I've put, uh, it's an MOU, fresh air, that's a breath of fresh air because what we've got well, what we've had up till quite recently is a lot of opposition to uh, making changes, a lot of opposition in, from the, perhaps the, the farming sector to um, address this uh, problem and even recognise there's a problem. Well, what happened recently, and this is really nothing to do with the regional council, and that's probably what's great about it, is that these people here, the Rotorua Pastoral Collective and another organisation, the Lake Water Quality Society, who are at opposite ends of the pole in terms of what they expect to happen in, in this uh, uh, lake catchment, actually got together and signed this MOU called the Waiora Agreement. And uh, I haven't got a whole lot of detail on that um, other than to just tell you my understanding of it is, is that they accept the uh, lake targets in terms of nitrogen and phosphorus targets and so instead of going around in circles and arguing whether targets are right or wrong, um, they're now looking at how do we work together for a better water quality outcome. So I'm pretty excited to see what happens there, and I think that's what, going to be one of the major groups that we'll engage with um, on an ongoing basis um, to see what the solutions might be for Lake Rotorua with respect to, as I say, land management change and land use change, because it will be a combination of those. Thank you.